Hey everyone, I am providing you the great story of scientists in a box. This is a presentation on notes, kind of a recap of what this idea of relativity means, what time and space have going for each other and how we come up about to all these different ideas. So um, a scientist in a box is kind of how I imagine the story. But before we get to the scientist in the box, um, we're just going to go back to what does it mean to have light? With light, it's pretty simple. This is the great revolution of 1905. Al comes along, Einstein says, you know what you need to fix all of physics is this rule known as the constancy of the speed of light. Basically, we had this situation where all of physics wasn't quite meshing up. It seemed as though if you just figure out a little thing about magnetic fields and a little thing about electric fields, while it wasn't quite jibing, we're almost there. And Einstein said, no, you fundamentally have this other issue out of whack. And that is how light travels through space. So we proposed, and we've later shown that this is the case, this thing known as the constancy of the speed of light. So if you've got a laser beam coming out of the laser, like so, no matter who you are, no matter how you're measuring that, that speed, which we just simply refer to the speed of light or the speed of light in space, the speed of light through a vacuum, the natural speed of light is fast. You know this because whenever you turn on the lights, you don't have to wait. It's so fast, it only takes eight minutes to get from the sun to here. So fast, it only takes two million years to get from the Andromeda galaxy to here. But so fast, really, that you can't really detect. You don't have any sense that there's any speed at all. It seems instantaneous. And so this notion of some speed at 300 million or three times 10 to the eighth meters per second, meters yay big, probably yay big. Actually, yes, I have a meter stick right here. This many, this thing, 300 million times in one second. This is a couple hundred thousand miles every second, multiple times around the earth every second, et cetera. Stupid fast. This comes up so often, we just refer to this as C, speed of light. And when anyone asks you, hey, what's the speed of light in this case, in space, it's going to be C. Great, easy. This rule, by the way, is called constancy of the speed of light. The other rule that Einstein, the postulate kind of foundation for all of physics that Einstein restates, although it seems obvious, is that rules are universal. If you've got one event happening, no matter how you, no matter where that event happens or how you observe it, the physics should be the same. It seems too basic to even write down. So. We'll see how that all applies. Let's go to this basic situation. What if me here on this very fast skateboard happens to be throwing things, this blue sphere at you, my friend over here, who seems mm, wary. <laughs> of the ball being launched them through space. What is it that their view of this ball happens to be? How do they measure the rate at which that ball comes to them? This is what we call a relativistic addition problem. And if you imagine that the skateboard goes uh, 10 meters per second, this is a kind of, this is a fast, uh, an Olympic sprint kind of pace, uh, bicycle kind of pace. You can 10 meters a second, it's not unreasonable. And maybe I can throw this ball at 20 meters per second, relatively reasonable. And it stands to reason that if I'm on a moving platform and I throw something from that moving platform, I get the moving platform motion and the additional speed at which I can throw something. And so it's probably not a surprise to you 
that these two things add together. You get 30, right? 30 meters per second. You can catch it, it will be okay. And you can find all the other kinds of possibilities for this. If I happen to throw it the opposite direction, you'd have a plus and a minus. If something was going, if I was on a platform going 10 meters per second one way and I threw the ball the opposite direction relative to me at 10 meters per second, you could get it to drop straight down from an outside observers or an outside frame of reference. In class and in videos, we showed a case where you could be moving from left to right but launch something vertically and the vertical launch would still take that horizontal velocity. No big deal. Easy. So what if we took this other case where instead of launching just this baseball or whatever I happen to have, I was using laser, which is firing out some beam of light. I ask you how fast is that? You would quite readily say, well, that's the speed of light. Light travels at the speed of light. This is traveling at C, which is 300 million meters per second. I apparently have to write out the whole thing just so that we can get a sense that that's really fast. You are already nervous standing over here because what are you going to do with this ray of light? You probably you get longer arms and you cover your eyes like so. Good eye production from for lasers. Let's imagine that you're trying to gauge that beam how fast it's coming at you. And I happen to be on a skateboard platform that goes at half of the speed of light. Oops. 0.5, see, 50% of the speed of light. If you do the math, that's 150 million meters per second, still quite fast. And the question is, how fast does that beam of light travel to you? And there is the obvious answer, and then there is the obvious answer. The obvious answer, the gut answer, is that things should add together. That's what we're used to with the ball being thrown from the moving platform. But the other obvious answer is to say the speed of light is always the speed of light. And that is, that is going to mess with your gut intuition. That doesn't seem like it should be right because other additions of velocity don't add that way. But that's the, uh, the premise of this rule that Einstein comes up with, that the speed of light is always the speed of light. And this is disturbing, right? You don't have any feeling experience intuition for this because you don't see this firsthand. Worse yet, maybe, if I happen to have been traveling in the opposite direction on the skateboard, but sending the laser this way, this would still be 300 million meters per second. And worse still, maybe, if you were running away from the beam or even running towards the beam, you would still detect and be right that the beam is coming at you at a velocity of 300 million meters per second. That's the way light travels. That's the thing that had to be set in nature in order for the rest of physics to work. And this is the twist that Einstein figured out. By the way, Einstein, he was an Einstein, right? He's pretty sharp. 1905 in physics, we call this the miracle year in some cases. He wrote three papers. One was on this thing known as special relativity. Another was on this thing called the photoelectric effect, which revolutionized this thing called quantum mechanics, which we'll get to later. And another was on uh, Brownian motion, which is like, how can you kind of get a gauge of really small things that you can't see based on other things that get bounced around under a microscope slide. Um, he gets a Nobel prize for the photoelectric effect to show, we'll see later, that beams of light can smack into particles in non-intuitive ways. Uh, this, which is kind of what we think of for Einstein, it's like so crazy, it kind of sat there to, 
to do the physics that it needed to do, but there was a lot of work to kind of figure out how this could be right and if it's right and experimentally, how do we put this to a test? We'll show you. Let's say, let's take this idea that light travels at the speed of light, no matter how you see it, no matter how things are moving relative to one another. And let's apply it to this situation called the scientist in the box. And the situation that I'm gonna suggest is that you've got some laser sitting here at the bottom of your box. By the way, this is a glass box. We can see into it. And whatever's going on inside the box, we can see from our reference frame outside of the box. And um, we can detect, like someone turns on the laser beam and it flies, flies, travels from the bottom of the box to the top of the box. And maybe you've got some kind of detector here that says, here's when the light hits the top of the box. I'll leave them. Let's put a little detector here. And there might be some kind of timing mechanism that says, here's the amount of time it takes to go from the laser, flips the switch to the detector right here, top here. And that could be, I mean, sure, there are details to figure out. Sure, it's technologically sophisticated, but we can do this. We can measure how long does it take to go from one place to another, even for very short amounts of time. Now, for the person inside the box, and even for us right now, we'd say the laser beam travels from here, gets to the top, and you would time that, say, yep, that was really fast. Great. Now, let's take another situation or slightly revise the situation. What I'm gonna do is highlight this, push the button, duplicate it, oh my goodness. And imagine that this box is not just sitting there in space, but is actually going, traveling from left to right. Now, a funny thing about motion is it's always relative, right? For the person inside the box, just like for you in the back seat of a car, you can juggle, you can pour yourself a, a, a smoothie. I don't know what you've got in the back seat of your car. It depends on how treacherous you're willing to be. You know, you've, you've got a tumbler full of, of Diet Coke and you're pouring it into your glass so that you can sip Diet Coke in the back seat of the car whatever. You can do that even if the car is traveling at seven miles per hour because everything in the car is in the same reference frame. We say you're all at rest with respect to each other. So things pour, toss, interact in really normal. It's as if you are, and you are all in kind of a still room relative to each other in the backseat of the car, in the plane, on this planet Earth, racing around through space in all kinds of crazy ways. Everything that happens within the box for say the physicist here, just goes from the bottom of the box to the top of the box. It starts here, it ends here. Great, and I'll even etch that in like so. Put a couple of arrows here. We could say that's a short distance. Use the thickest crane I could find, apparently. However, that's for the person inside the box. Us outside of the box, if we see this motion going from here to here, everything that's happening in the box is also moving. So for our point of view, we see this laser beam start here and end over here at the bottom of the box to the top of the box, same event, same start and end point we agree on, but where that box is, is different for the outside observer. So for us, it goes like so, which I would dare claim is a longer distance. Which is funny. We have described from the outside of the box that 
the place that the laser beam starts and ends in our sense of space, I'm going like this, I've got the screen in front of me like you can see. It starts and ends in different, different places than what the person inside the box would describe, you know, because we're measuring it differently. We both say the event is started at the bottom at the laser, ended at the top of the box. For the person inside the box, well, they were with the thing, they were traveling with the thing. So it only really took this route. For us outside of the box, it took this route. Now, this might not be such a big deal, right? Like this happens all the time. If I were in this box or in the car, in the demo of the cart that launched the ball straight up into the air, if you were on the cart, you would see the ball go up and come back down. If I'm walking like I usually do with the, the dodgeball that I have behind me over here that I carry around campus with me, if I'm walking and I toss it up into the air and catch it, I would just say it goes up and down and you would see me going by and you'd say it takes some kind of arcing path. I'd say, ah, oh, that's funny, no big deal. But with light, it gets funnier because this travels at speed of light. 300 meters, 300 million meters per second. And this from the bottom, to the top from the frame of reference inside of the box travels at the speed of light. You say, Adam, you just said the same thing. Yeah, it's the constancy of the speed of light. It travels at the speed of light. No matter how you observe it, no matter what is happening to that reference frame or the, the platform that the light is coming from. Now, that creates a really interesting scenario. That means that the light, I get the, green one here. There we go. the light can travel at a certain speed for this long distance or at a certain same speed for the short distance. If it travels the same speed for each of those, for the short distance, it will go just a short time. Maybe our physicist in the box is measuring this. He says the time takes two tenths of a second. That's pretty long, actually, but let's say it's that's a measurable thing. For this physicist, or for us, I should say, out here, I'll draw us. You know, really, we're all the same, and you're looking over here and over there at the same time, as this passes by, you would say that took something longer. Maybe it took half a second, which is pretty ridiculous. That time would be proportional to the length that it had to travel since it was the same speed. This seems weird, but if you drive 70 miles an hour to Layton, that will take you a shorter time to go that shorter distance than if you drive 70 miles per hour to Provo. I'm starting here in Ogden, by the way, just for reference. So what does that mean? Well, that means these two people, old wobbly eyes can look in all directions guy standing here, he measures that event to have taken half a second. The same event, this physicist says, took less time. In other words, we see something happen. We agreed this thing happened. It went from the bottom of the box to the top of the box, but we measure different amounts of time. And you may ask, seems like a natural question, who's right? The answer is, everyone. You say, no, 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 none of this like, oh, your ideas are all valuable. We love you all. No. What's the real answer? The answer is everyone's right. Everyone's physically right. The reality of it is that speed 
It's the same for all of those. The distances are really different for both of those. And the distances being different means the times have to have been different in reality, not just a perception. This is an outcome that's described by the, the big term special relativity. It's a special case of here's what happens to our times as we are in different frames of reference. We agree on the speed, especially for light. We all say, if you're measuring the speed of light, we're all gonna measure the same thing. In addition, for what it's worth, we agree on all speeds. So kind of a fun thought problem, let's go back here, is that this physicist in the box is gonna look down at us and it's gonna look as though we are moving relative to this guy in the opposite direction, right? Just like if you look at the scenery as your car passes at a fast rate, you see the scenery go behind you. We'll agree on that rate. Whatever that motion happens to be, we'll both say the other seems to be moving past us or the relative speed between us is the same. That's not a problem. So we agree on all speeds. However, that means in reality, we measure different times. You will say, but, or, so does that mean that there's a special gimmicky kind of thing happening or this one's right and this other one? I understand. These times, these differences in times, these relative times, relative to your frame of reference or how you're moving relative to some other frame of reference, those times are real. We've got this gut feeling that time is just something that's clicking on the clock in the gear of the clock or in the swing of a pendulum or in a pulse or something like that. But time is something that is determined by our sense of space. It is something that is just as variable as us moving through distances. And those two things have to go hand in hand. Now there's an additional fun little thing. That is, if we agree on all the speeds, but we disagree and disagree for good reason on the times, those two things, times are different, but all speeds are the same. You may have heard that I mean, back, back when I was growing up, we would write that, that speeds, we would write it this way, we'd say dirt, it was cute that distances are rates times times or how far you go is your speed times your time and this is dirt was just a cute little mnemonic or in other words if we rearrange this the rate is a distance per time um, the way i would write this is to say speed velocity equal to a distance or a length for a time. And you know this. You might not remember that you know this, but since you have cars that measure their speeds in miles per hour, that is a miles per hour is a distance per a time. It's a ratio of those two things. When we did graphs of motion and had what we call linear motion or constant motion show that the motion was always the same when we released the bowling ball or whatever it happened to be on the flat table. Uh, we were taking a ratio of what we graphed as distance on a vertical axis and time on the horizontal axis. And the slope of those data showed us that ratio of distance to time or the fraction of distance divided by time. Okay, fine. Great, thank you, Adam, for the lesson and what speed is. But here's the thing. If we agree on this for all frames of reference, but we disagree, it's a happy disagreement on the time. I'll put a, a smiley face. It's a happy disagreement. It's just different. If we agree on the speed, but disagree on these times, we also 
must disagree on distances. So special relativity doesn't just say that times will be measured differently from different frames of reference, but our distances are going to be measured differently. Hmm. This has all kinds of weirdities associated with it. In short, what it means is that um, as you are traveling through space and measuring certain times, you're going to measure distances that go along with those times. And if someone is measuring what you are doing from the outside and measuring certain times associated with whatever you're doing, they're gonna measure distances and whatever you're doing that are associated with their view of you or their reference frame measuring onto another reference frame. This is, this, is, um, this is a lot to swallow all of a sudden. If it makes you feel better, <laughs> uh, there's all kinds of great implications for this. Most of them <laughs> come from science fiction. The most you probably have heard of them typically would be in science fiction. And they say, hey, let's do this warp thing. Let's do this, let's go faster so we can get other places. If just going faster, was all you could do, you'd, you'd never get anywhere in space in the science fiction realm. But if going faster meant you changed the nature of time for yourself and you changed the distances you were traveling through, then you've got kind of some extra credit. So a lot of science fiction says, hey, let's go faster and faster and faster. And the time, the spaces in between, the distances in between point A and point B are actually gonna get smaller for you as you get faster. So you get to do these special things. Quick uh, trivia thing, if you're classic, like, hey, the whole Star Wars thing, the Millennium Falcon, Han Solo, talks about, there's this legendary line that keeps coming back in that uh, entire franchise, talking about the Kessel Run and Han Solo doing the Kessel Run. And he talks about doing the Kessel Run in 12 parsecs. If you're a physicist, the first thing you, you, when you think, oh, someone did something really fast, you usually think fast means a short amount of time. And when he first stated that I did the Kessel run at 12 parsecs, you throw up some red flags because parsecs is a unit of distance in astronomy. And it doesn't at first sound like it makes any sense. But if you think about it as I went really fast and did this thing in a really short amount of something, you could also say, I did it, I went so fast, I made this distance shorter. So he was bragging that he actually squished space. And there's other, in the movie Solo, there's some other descriptions of how the space would, you know, how you take a shortcut and make that distance smaller. A lot of that gets into general relativity. A lot of you will have questions about other movies. You may have seen like Interstellar and what happened to this guy versus this other guy. But in real practical terms, like how would you measure these time differences? It does turn out you can measure them in um, some particle physics kinds of experiments and say, if we're sitting still, but these subatomic particles are going through space and only have certain amounts of lifetime, they're, the fact that they're traveling fast can change how we measure their lifetimes versus how the particle would have measured its own lifetime. Maybe more practical if you were doing this um, is you could be sitting here on the planet or here on the surface. My smiles have gotten broader. And you, you hold on to a clock with a certain timing device on it. And you put another very precise I should have practiced drawing planes. At one point I thought I would be an aeronautical engineer. Uh, probably this is a good reason not to be an aeronautical engineer. This thing is going very fast, but not speed of light fast, just airplane fast. And it has on it its own clock. And you set the clock and you say, go. You're not gonna measure differences in minutes or even seconds or even tenths of a second. But if you can get 
very precise clock, like an atomic clock, and measure out to the millionths of a second. And we do have these devices. They're just not practical for you to wear on your wrist or in your phone. Then you will, when this plane does its thing, come back, comes back, lands. Uh, oh dear, landed poorly apparently. You will measure a different amount of time on this clock versus this clock. So you can do some experiments to actually show this. Another thing is that when you use a GPS, it's using satellites to detect where you are and it's using kind of a triangulation between a couple of satellites. It's sending signals to your location or your device and reflecting those back or sending those back and saying, all right, where are you based on how far you are from one thing versus another thing. You can imagine the timing that has to take place for those particular calculations. It's gotta be super, super, super precise. In fact, it's so precise, it has to take into account relativity, both in the special relativity and the next thing that we'll get to for time and space, general relativity. So the very devices that are locating you and say, hey, I'm at the grocery store, or here I am on the Google map, that is actually using and applying these principles of relativity that seem so goofy. So sure, it seems goofy, but you're using it all the time, whether you know it or not. Okay, that's enough for now. Uh, late, we will get into general relativity and how the Earth itself and all things out there in space actually warp it. And that changes the nature of the shape of the space and passage of time, both. Until then, I'll see you. Well, until then, I'll see you whenever then is. Bye.